The man I'd like to introduce today is Sid Goddard. Sid uh, spent time in the RAAF during the war, flew lots of aircraft, but the one that he fell in love with was the Mosquito, the Havilland Mosquito. He's going to talk about it today. Afterwards, he flew with MMA and ANSET for 32 years. For 25 of those years, he was their uh, check and training captain, and it was uh, training on all of the types that the, the company flew. For the last five years, he was the manager of flight operations, and when he retired from that, he went to New Guinea for four years as director of operations in New Guinea. I'd like to introduce you to Sid Goddard. A plane that I really enjoyed. That is the Havilland Mosquito. It was generally considered to be the outstanding, well, the out, outstanding warplane operated by by the Allies in World War II. And the Air Chief Marshal, Sir Basil Emery, stated that it was the finest service aircraft, without exception, ever built in in Britain. It was faster than the the Spitfire, and it could, could perform an, an upward roll with one propeller feather. Now initially when de Havilland first submitted the, the concept and the plans to the air ministry, they, were not, they weren't impressed. Here we've got a, a wooden aeroplane, unarmed, with only a thousand pound bomb. And so they didn't get approval for it. So, the Havilland were so convinced that they continued the, the, the construction of this aeroplane at their own expense. But during 1940, when the prototype was, was getting close to completion, it was realised that, that at least it had some potential, so they initially gave an order for 50, 50 bombers to be constructed. Now, on the 25th of November, Geoffrey de Havilland conducted the first official test. There's some suggestion that's been written that he did a, an unofficial test flight a month or two beforehand, but the official test flight was on the 25th of November, and this was an absolutely resounding success in every way, and it was also realised that the aeroplane had the capacity and the internal uh, the ability and the power and the capacity to not just carry a thousand pound bomb but in fact the four thousand pound bomb that, that the aeroplane became famous for. You see the bomber with the glass nose there and I think that was a were flown by a New Zealand squadron in Britain. Now there's the prototype it doesn't look a, a lot different from the, the aeroplanes we'll see later on. But shortly after Dunkirk, it was realised that a, a fighter bomber was urgently required as an attack aircraft. So the, the order was changed to 20 bombers and 30 heavy fighters. Now these fighters were fit, fitted with a four Hispano 20 metre cannon. Cannon, you just heard all about those with the previous speaker. In fact, he knows more about them than I did. But and four Browning machine guns in the nose. So the cannon were virtually in the place in this aeroplane where the, the bomb base normally would have been. Now talking about the construction of the Mosquito, the, both, the main thing to know is that it was really made, it was really made of plywood. <coughs> and, and it consisted of three eight inch sheets of Eucadorian balsa wood sandwiched in between sheets of Canadian birch. Now a casein glue was developed and this provided the strength, but it was basically was a it was a, a plywood. Finally, after all this was done, a covering of very fine sort of uh, material, cotton material, was placed over the surface. Now, when it came to the wings, making the wings, these were built as a single unit. They weren't built as two wings as you as a normal one. And also in the construction as well as the the glue on the plywood, each aeroplane was estimated to contain 30,000 brass screws. This made it added to the strength. And towards the end of the initial construction, it was found that they could, they developed a stronger glue with a, 
a uh, formaldehyde base because the glue, the, the, the strength of the glue was really the secret in the strength of this construction. Now altogether, as I said there, there were 7,781 mosquitoes were constructed. Now the versatility of that mosquito was really the, the surprising and the, and the, and indicates just how great this aeroplane was. It started off as a, it was low and high altitude daytime bombers, there were night dedicated bombers. The Pathfinder group had a, another model. There were day and night fighters, the intruder attack aircraft, and the maritime strike, there weren't many of them. And lastly, further reconnaissance. Just briefly on performance, and it doesn't mean very much because there's so many different models that they vary, but overall it was generally they accepted that the top speed was about 318, it cruised at 270, uh, I flew the Mark 6 and we cruised about 270, 275, and they've given the range as 1300 nautical miles. Now, I question that also because I think we were doing longer flights. So I'll start off with a Mosquito Bomber because now the Bomber version played an important role in the high altitude bombing raids. Berlin and return, four hours and the 4,000 bomb, we all knew about that. During, even in Australia we heard about that. But as previously told you, there were more than 60,000 Allied um, servicemen who actually killed over, over Europe. And more than double that amount were casualties. But 60,000 were killed. This was uh, terrible. Because many of the early bombers, both the two-engine and the four-engine, were quite slow. The four-engine Stirling, for instance, took eight and a half hours to go from England, Berlin and back again. And some of the others, like the Halifaxes and the Wellingtons, and even the Flying Fortresses, weren't very much faster. And the casualties on all of these aeroplanes were very, very high, particularly in the early years. But of course, the Lancaster was the main heavy bomber. This is an excellent aircraft. And, uh, but yet, even so, with the Lancaster, there was, the casualties were very high. You just heard it. An old friend of mine, I think a lot of you people know him here, that's uh, Jerry Bateman. I was talking to Jerry a couple of days ago, and he was on Lancasters. And after about four or five operations, he already lost a few of his mates. By the time he got to 12 and 14, they were almost all of them lost. And he said, by the time we, you normally go 30 operations for a tour, by the time he got to about halfway, he told me that he was actually resigned to the fact that he would, he probably wasn't going to make, wasn't going to make it. So the casualties were very high. In some way, and because even with the Lancaster, as good as it was, the, uh, they were still vulnerable right up to when they returned, and occasionally they'd be attacked in the circuit area when they arrived back at home base. Now, when these aircraft were shot down, you'd be anything from seven to ten crew were lost. Sometimes they were able to bail out, but frequently, you know, the whole, the, the whole crew were lost. Whereas with a mosquito, at least, if they shot a mosquito down, you're looking at two people. And the mosquito was so fast, and particularly after the bombers dropped, that very few of them were ever caught out in the next phase. But the mosquitoes did make a difference. I know it's generally accepted the Lancaster did the bulk of the work, and they did. But the mosquitoes did make a difference. Bomber Command mosquitoes flew 28,000 missions, 28,000 missions, with a loss of 193 aircraft. Now that's a loss of 0.7%, which is a loss of seven in 1,000, which is which is fairly good from a point of view of loss. And of course, the heavy aircraft percentage was far greater. Also, with a mosquito and its contribution, a mosquito bomber holds the record for the most missions flown by any Allied aircraft in World War II. One mosquito flew a total of 213 missions, and it survived the war. See the bomber 
See a picture of the bomb, it's all, normally got the glass nose, that one's got the bomb doors open. Now, the one that's closer to the phone a little bit, the fighter bomber. And that's the Mark VI. You can pick the fighter bomber as from the, the fighter, you can see the four machine guns, the nose are, cannons are a bit harder to see because they come underneath. Now this was the most numerous version of the mosquitoes. It was 2,290 um, produced. They were, but when they were used by the intruder squadrons of fighter command and the strike wings of coastal command, they, they were armed with these 860 pound rockets and or two 250 pound bombs. And because of that, all the Mark Sixes had strengthened wings to be able to take the rocket rails. I'll just talk about a few of the targets. One of the high risk targets, and they, a few that got some publicity, was the, the prison complex at Amiens in France. Now where 600 French resistance and other prisoners were held, and they were told they were held for probable execution. So there was a, a lot of pressure on the on the out of RAF or Britain to do something about it. So the three squadrons and RAF and Australian 464 and New Zealand squadrons attacked this prison complex in Amiens. And on the main building holding the Gestapo officers and all the prison guards, the whole building was destroyed completely and the surrounding walls were were, were blasted. Now, they said most of the prisoners escaped, but quite a few of them were recaptured, but they estimate that half of them escaped. You, you wonder whether it was really worth it, but at least that was it. This target was heavily defended, and that's why they were reluctant to do it for some time. And amongst the mosquitoes lost was the commander of the whole operation, was a group captain, Pickard. I'll just tell you a couple more of these. The second one that, took, that they got a lot of publicity for was the the raid on the Hague, Netherlands, where the Gestapo stored the complete central population register of the whole of Holland. Now when they, they attacked it, it was so accurate that the bombs and high explosives and incendiaries went through the, the doors and the windows and the whole of the records were destroyed. And they said in the article I read on it that the, the local Dutch people only about half a mile away in a, in a bread queue weren't even affected by it. So they, even in those days, they could get quite accurate with this type of uh, raid. And the third one I just mentioned was the Gestapo headquarters at, at Schellis in Copenhagen in Denmark. Now the, the Danish resistance, Danish resistance, had been requesting a raid for some time, but the, t the target was so heavily defended that the, the air command were reluctant because they thought it was a waste of time. But finally, with the mosquitoes, they took 20 mosquitoes were involved. They were three waves, and they were able to demolish the whole lot. And 55 of their senior Gestapo officers were, were reported to be killed. And all the German records that they were worried about, and they were also destroyed. But they lost four mosquitoes in that raid. Now. Well, I'm still talking about the Mark VI. Some of the notable pilots, and some of the old blokes here will remember them. There's Wing Commander Guy Gibson. He was a CO 617 Pathfinder. He crashed in, in Holland. And Group Captain Len Cheshire, VC, famous for other things. Uh, he became the, the CO after, after um, Gibson was killed. Another one you may know is John Catseyes Cunningham. Now he was an outstanding night fighter, where he got his name, but in later years he, he became famous as, as uh, the Concord captain. And uh, I'm not sure whether he was chief pilot or test pilot on that, but he was flying the Concord later. Another one you all know, of course, uh, was Keith Miller, the Australian test cricketer. He flew the Mark VI Mosquito over there in an English squadron, who when he asked, how he coped with stress as a test batsman, replied in his famous statement, stress is when you have a message from it up your ass. <laughs> cricket, cricket is not stress. <laughs> uh, there you are. The last one of the noted people was squadron leader Eric Brown. You wouldn't know the name, I didn't either. 
and he was a test pilot credited in the Guinness Book of Records with having flown the greatest number of aircraft types in the world and he was the first pilot to land a mosquito on an aircraft carrier and that was quite a feat. One of the, it, there weren't a lot of them but in Britain they used the mosquito night fighter. It's a special aeroplane. You just see the guns out the front of that one too. Now here, well, you can see the cannon on the bottom there. Machine guns are always prominent but the, the cannon underneath are a bit harder to see. Mosquito night fighter. This was equipped with aircraft interception radar. It was called a device called Serrate. And this allowed them to track the German night fighters over UK. Now the Luftwaffe was equipped with VF-110s and but mainly JU-88s. A good aeroplane but still uh, not of lower performance anyway than the Mosquito. 258 Luftwaffe night fighters were officially destroyed for the loss of 70 mosquitoes. So they didn't altogether have it their own way, but that's about three and a half to one. We're still on the night fighters and night flying. Group Captain Len Cheshire, in command of the Pathfinders, planned to use Lancasters and did for a while, but finally, because the Lancaster was very vulnerable to anti-aircraft fire, particularly low down, and so the mosquitoes are used with great success. Now this, this exercise required high speed maneuvering at very low altitudes to, to pinpoint the, to, with pinpoint accuracy because they had to put these flares at, at the right spot so that the heavy bombers coming over could accurately bomb the target. Not, it didn't do a lot of this but I've just mentioned the photographic mosquitoes. This was, was possibly the outstanding photographic aircraft of World War II. With no armament, no bombs. It was light and terrifically fast. It could easily climb to altitude, um, photograph the target and return without being detected. And I couldn't find any records of photographed mos mosquitoes that were lost. Now I'll have a quick talk about the handling. Not too much to tell here. Taxiing was pretty straightforward. It's just a normal, obviously not as easy as flying or taxiing a tricycle but with excellent brakes and very responsive engines, it wasn't a problem. The only thing that it was important that you had the flaps up completely, and also any run-up you did before takeoff, the flaps had to be up. Uh, on the takeoff, takeoff. This is fairly exciting aeroplane to take off. There's a slight tendency to swing to the to the left, and during, but this could be offset by just slightly leading with a for throttle. But with 3,000 revs, when you got to 3,000 revs, this, this aeroplane was really going somewhere. After lift off, the aircraft was held just level for a few seconds after the undercarriage was protected. As soon as you got 150 k's, you could start climbing, and you normally took off with 50 to 15 degrees of flap. 25 was possible, but I as far as I know, we only use 15. You kept the 3,000 revs on, you could keep it on for a, for a minute, but generally after takeoff, as soon as you got established, you came back to 2850. But as I say, the 3,000 RPM could be used in a combat situation for up to five minutes. Now stalling, this is something which is interesting. Now when you consider the high performance of the Mosquito, the stalling speeds were quite low. With the gear, um, and flaps up and fully loaded, the stalling speed was only 113 knots. That's quite low. But with the gear and flaps down, the stalling speed was only 96 knots. But more important, the stall was so gentle that right up to the point of stall, the aeroplane could still fly ball, and at the point of stall, the nose just dropped, and usually one wing or the other would fall. And as soon as any speed was retained, it came, it came out of the, the uh, stall immediately. That was nice from a handling point of view at very low speeds. Now, aerobatics, it's, li it's listed in the handling notes that we can do them. I never did any, I must admit. Uh, but the fact that they can be done gives them some indication of the, of the maneuverability of the aeroplane. They list the roll. Can, 
a normal roll can be, on the level can be done as low as 200 knots, quite slow. But a climbing roll, uh, you needed 305 knots. But uh, in all the rolls, it, it, they had to be barreled slightly or enough to keep both engines running. A loop is a different story. That needed 330 all the way around. Next, handling on the landing. This was a nice aeroplane to land. Coming into the circuit, get down to 160 knots, put the gear down, and always use full <coughs> flap for landing. Fine for the, a lightly loaded aeroplane, which it normally is when you get back from a trip. This, the approach speed over the fence was only 110 knots, which is not too bad. And despite its high performance, the Mosquito was very easy to land. And one of the reasons goes back to the stall characteristic. This aeroplane was quite nice to handle, almost to the point of stall. So an aeroplane that's got a, such a docile and nice stall like that, you could expect it to be nice to land. In a few minutes, I'll just tell you about the Australian operations. 36 of the Mark VI pilot bombers were shipped to Australia and they were allocated to number one squadron RAAF. They arrived in these camouflage colours, and uh, that's A52526, mine was A52521. They were painted silver because of the effect of the hot sun. Now, because of this glue situation and the fact that it's plywood, they were worried about the heat, and I think they're quite right in doing it. So here you see them all, and one, the one right at the end there has already been painted silver. But I never saw them in these colours. When I got my aeroplane, it was silver, and they, they were all silver. Now, our squadron, number one squadron, was based on Labuan Island, North Borneo, you all know where it is. And our target, our, well, the task really was Joe's slow level attack squadrons against, against uh, Japanese bases in Borneo and generally in the southwest Pacific area. That's a commanding officer aeroplane, I like it. 513, yes, yeah. Talking about these attacks, my, from my experience, the machine guns were not noticeably effective. I've, I've never known why they were there, but obviously they were, and quite a few aeroplanes, that's all they had. But the Hispano cannon, as you've heard earlier, they were, they were, a different, they were really were a good proposition. They, they, you could actually feel the retardation when you fire them, and if you're hitting a building or anything like that, you can really see you're getting somewhere. Taking off from Labuan, we're based on this island up at Labuan. It had a few problems. The runway was only 3,500 feet. That's not very long. The unsealed surface on one strip, down one strip was a, a squadron of bow fighters. On the other strip was a squadron of kitty hawks. So if you swung on takeoff, you did maximum damage to. And this is what happened. We lost two aeroplanes this way mainly because with a heavy loaded aeroplane and short runway there was a tendency to try and pour the power on too quickly and jack the tail up too quickly so and you had the gyroscopic effect and the two that did crash two aeroplanes that did crash were reported said it happened so quickly that it really caught them but fortunately both the crews survived now on the operations i just mentioned them was mainly it was all low-level strafing and targets of opportunity and, and trying to, to re stop the barges and, and the equipment getting through to the Japanese bases. The only difference I found was one, but we were doing some flights from going from Borneo right across the South China Sea to what was called Indochina, we call it Vietnam now. Just a point on this one, it was very low very low and, oh there it is here, yeah. and, and there was some suggestion that the Japanese might have had radar and I doubted it, but we were supposed to fly low all the way. And this was a total of six hours, including the time spent at Ever Targets. Flying over the ocean here, in the tropics like this, at times, and the, certainly when I flew it, it was absolutely calm. You can see why ships, or well, sailing people could be calm. The water was absolutely glassy, almost like a mirror. So any suggestion of really low flying became quite dangerous. So usually you had to jack it up to a couple of hundred feet, so you didn't have to be trying to estimate how high you were above the ground. The other feature about this, if you fly that long, very low over the ocean, particularly over 
tropical air, there seems to be a salt content in the air because by the time we got back, there seemed to be a, quite a, a lot of salt on the windscreen and you, you just could not land if there was any sun shining up blinds. They had to come around and come in the other way. At the war's end, and my end, nearly five of our mosquitoes went to Japan to, to be with the occupation forces, but the balance of us all flew via ballot propane back to Richmond Air Base in Sydney with all our mosquitoes and never to fly again. And that was the sad part, really, because that's what happens in those days. Just a quick one there. I've asked for invite any questions, but it's so long ago, I've probably forgotten the answers, but you, you, can, you can try it. Another carriage, nuts and brakes with that hydraulic or pneumatic? Uh, pneumatic. And I didn't think it was a good system. Uh, and that was one of my criticism, in my personal criticism, because uh, the, the pneumatic system also fired the cannon. And on one occasion we came back and they, somehow or other we didn't have any brakes anyway because, because the pneumatic system, uh, something had jammed and we lost all the air. So I did, we didn't like the pneumatic system for that. Set. How did they fly if you lost an engine? Oh, oh, it wasn't a problem at all <coughs> at, on one engine, but this is an important point. <coughs> at no stage did we ever lose an engine in the squadron. And I refer back to and, and, uh, my friend over here with the Lancaster, I spoke to Terry Bateman. At no stage in 30 operations with Lancaster, you know, you've still got the Rolls Royce, did he ever have an engine failure? The, those engines way back in those days were so reliable. I never had a suggestion of uh, engine failure at any stage. Which German aircraft were comparable and what were the comparisons? <coughs> well, I don't know. They said here the JU-88 wasn't quite, you know, it was it was fair competition because we lost, uh, they lost 210 and we lost 70 sort of thing, so it gave them a reasonable go, but but uh, at the time they didn't have anything, <coughs> the mosquito had it all to themselves from a speed point of view. In the end, the Germans were producing an aeroplane, and it was a wooden one too, which was going to be faster than, than, slightly faster than the Mosquito, but the bombing was so intense that they could never get to the stage where they could fully produce it. <laughs>